Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's edition of Pathcast. Today is April 14, 2020. And in fact, in many parts of India, today is celebrated as New Year. So I wish you all happy Rangali Bihu, happy Baisakhi, and happy Bishu. So I am Rifat Manan, and I'm joined by my good friend, Emilio Madrigal, who is in Boston. Today, we are excited to welcome Dr. Ali Khuram. He is a senior lecturer and consultant pathologist in the School of Clinical Dentistry in the University of Sheffield in United Kingdom. So today he is going to give a talk on oral pathology, which he has entitled A Mouthful of Neoplasms and Overview of Odontogenic Tumors. Thank you, Dr. Khuram, for joining us today. And thanks to all our viewers. And please feel free to post your questions and comments on Facebook as well as YouTube windows. And Dr. Kuram will answer those at the end of the session. Thank you, Dr. Kuram. Over to you now. Thank you, Rifat, for asking me to speak today. Uh, and I hope all of you are staying safe in these testing times. Um, so today I'll just cover uh, or just give you a basic overview of odontogenic tumors. So, there is a large number of lesions to cover, so I will try to touch upon most of those and hopefully uh, um, help you with some of the challenges. Um, so I'll start with a little bit of an introduction, uh, followed by recent changes to WHO classification, including new entities and changes to terminology. And then we'll look at some diagnostic challenges. Uh, and one thing that will keep recurring through the lecture is the importance of radiological correlation. So how have things changed uh, over the last 40 odd years? Um, quite a lot, actually. So in terms of the number of tumors, perhaps in 1992, we were already at 30 odontogenic tumors in the WHO classification. And since then, the attempt has been to Simplify, simplify things and make them easier and then reduce the number of entities. So the 2005 classification uh, just included tumors uh, at 29, uh, but what they did was they excluded the odontogenic cysts, which were previously a part of the classification. Uh, so what the 2017 classification has done now uh, is that the cysts have made a comeback. And in addition to those, there are 23 odontogenic lesions. So the number has been reduced. And in general, there's an attempt to simplify the classification of these lesions. So there's been renaming of some of the entities. So odontogenic keratocyst uh, that you may have heard of uh, has got its old name back. Um, I'll cover some of these in a bit more detail later on. There are some new entities such as sclerosing odontogenic carcinoma and primordial odontogenic tumor. Some older entities from the 1992 classification have been restored, and these include orthokeratinized odontogenic cyst and odontogenic carcinosarcoma. But some entities have also been removed to make way for the new ones, and these include things like calcifying cystic odontogenic tumor, and then the ameloblastic fibrodentinoma and odontoma. There have also been some changes to terminologies, particularly in relation to ossifying fibroma, and the word cemento has been added to highlight the fact that the, a part of these lesions are actually odontogenic in origin. So before I start going through the pathology, and I know it's a pathology cast and pathology talk, uh, I would just like to briefly take you through some of the features of radiology that we look at. So this is the uh, box standard um, dental panoramic radiograph. Uh, or an OPT or a DPT, which is something we look at pretty routinely when it comes to diagnosis of odontogenic tumors. Um, so here is the mandible. So here you can see that's the condyle of the mandible, that's the coronoid process, that's the ramus, angle, and then the body. And here's the maxilla. So of course we look at the teeth and any lesions that are in association with those teeth. But we also look at other structures, so things like the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus, the zygomatic process of buttress, um, the heart palate, etc. And the thing to have look for, of course, is the color of the lesion. So anything that's radiolucent, which means it looks darker and sort of dark gray or black in color, means it's got a lot of soft tissue in it, which allows the X-ray photons to pass through. 
and that gives us an idea of the consistency of the lesion. Whereas if a lesion is really opaque, so it looks a little bit like this, so it looks whiter uh, or like a tooth, that means it's hard tissue which is not allowing uh, those X-ray photons to easily pass through. We also look at the border of the lesion, so is it something that's fairly well defined or poorly defined, has got a regular outline. And then we look at any changes in the adjacent structures. So for example, if there is a lesion, suppose here in the mandible, are any of the teeth affected by it? Have they been moved around or displaced? Have they been damaged or resorbed? Is there expansion of the bone? And those sort of things give us an idea um, of the differences between benign and malignant tumors, and also between different benign tumors. We look at the locularity of the lesion. So if it's a unicystic lesion, uh, it's unilocular. Uh, or it's a multicystic lesion, uh, it's multilocular, and you get these multiple locules separated by these thin septi of bone. It almost gives you a soap bubble type appearance, and I'll show you some examples of that. So let's start with the new entity. So the first new entity that's been added to the WHO classification is the primordial odontogenic tumor. Uh, 2014 was the first time this case series described six cases of this new entity. And since then, a total of 18 cases have been described. Um, the WHO thought that the evidence was sufficient for it to be included as a new entity. The mean age uh, that involves is approximately 11 years, and 60% of the affected patients are males. Most of the lesions are asymptomatic, and what you get is a swelling, uh, particularly towards the outside or buccal aspect uh, of your face. Uh, but if the lesion is quite extensive, then you can get a swelling towards the inside or the lingual aspect as well. Uh, but almost always, they don't have any pain associated with these. When you look at the radiology of these lesions, they are radiolucent lesions. So if you have a look here, so they are dark in color compared to the bone around them, radiolucent, and they seem to always be in a dentigerous relationship, which means that um, they are surrounding a tooth. So here you can also see there's a tooth sitting right in the middle of the lesion, and then you've got this large radiolucent lesion um, surrounding it. And that seems to be sort of a common recurring theme. Now the majority of these tumors are unilocular, so you just get a sort of unicystic type appearance, but occasionally they can be multilocular, and here you can see very faint multiple septi within that tumor. So what sort of appearance should you expect? So it's usually quite well circumscribed and lobulated. Uh, when you look at the macroscopic appearance, you can see the multiple lobules and nodules. And here you can see there's a tooth buried within the tumor. Um, when you look at the histology, it's quite loose fibrous tissue, uh, quite fusiform, stellate fibroblasts, and you can get a slightly mixoid appearance. Uh, but the key feature is that all of this uh, fibrous tissue is surrounded by this uh, columnar, or in some cases, cuboidal epithelium. And this epithelium is thought to resemble the inner enamel epithelium, uh, from which uh, here is an example of uh, the embryology of a developing tooth. And you can see the inner ep enamel epithelium here, uh, just there. And it shows a similar sort of appearance of the nuclei shifting away from the basement membrane, showing quite prominent reversal of polarity. The connective tissue or fibrous tissue itself has got a very mesenchymal appearance. It's quite loose fibrous tissue, uh, quite bland and stellate fibroblasts. Uh, there's not much collagen in it. Uh, and like I said, the entire periphery is lined by these epithelial cells, which show quite a prominent palisaded appearance. The next new entity is sclerosing odontogenic carcinoma, which is a low-grade malignancy, but uh, is locally aggressive. It was first reported by uh, John Cutlass's group in Minnesota, uh, and since then it's uh, 11 cases have been reported in the literature, so it's still fairly rare. Um, it can involve the mandible or the maxilla, uh, and quite a wide age range can be involved, so 40 to 80 years of age. But one key feature to remember is that they're only locally aggressive, and there's so far no evidence that these metastasize. Radiologically, they've got a very uh, typical appearance, and you get this uh, 
almost a triangular teardrop shaped shadow uh, which is next to the lateral aspect of a tooth and a similar sort of appearance here as well now at first glance you might think that the appearance uh, doesn't look that worrying uh, but when you have a closer look you can see that some of these um, areas of these teeth are not as well defined so they seem to have been eaten away or resorbed by this tumor here as well you can see that the tumor actually extends into this tooth and is causing resorption of it in terms of histology um, you get these really fine small strands and islands of epithelium uh, which are embedded within this really sclerotic stroma now most of the time these epithelial islands are quite bland uh, you don't tend to see much atypia uh, you don't really see any mitosis uh, but these epithelial islands seem to be quite infiltrative uh, they don't have a capsule around them and there's obvious extension into the surrounding muscle and surrounding tissues. One key diagnostic feature is that you always see perineural invasion. So in terms of diagnosis, it is quite important to establish that, but also to look at the radiology uh, to see whether there's resorption or damage to the adjacent structures. Occasionally you can get uh, amyloid-like areas, uh, for example here, but these tend to be negative for Congo red. So when we come to the differential diagnosis and things like calcifying epithelial odontogenic tumor, they tend to be positive for Congo red. So that's quite a useful feature. So here's another picture just showing you these bland, very besized islands uh, which are scattered within this really sclerotic stroma. And uh, here's an example of a case that I had two years ago, a 43-year-old female uh, who presented with this fairly well-defined lesion involving the right maxilla. Uh, when you look at the radiology, you can see that there is a lesion here, which got a slightly jagged outline. And also some of the parts of these teeth have been resorbed. This is the picture from the surgery. So it's been locally excised with part of the bone has also been removed. And histology, a similar sort of appearance to what I've shown you previously, these largely bland epithelial islands uh, scattered within this very sclerotic stroma. But you tend to see this perineural as well as intraneural invasion. So here you can see there's a nerve fiber and you can see occasional tumor islands which are present within the nerve. Now it's not always possible to establish that on small biopsies. So immunohistochemistry for things like cytokeratins and S100 can help you establish perineural invasion. So if you see here, there's another nerve here and the tumor is wrapping around it. Um, but if you actually did cytokeratin staining coupled with S100, you can very nicely highlight and visualize whether perineural invasion is present or not. The differential diagnosis, of course, includes things like metastatic carcinoma, so exclude uh, a primary from anywhere else, which might be coming to the jaw, because the jaws are very common site for metastasis from other parts of the body. And then other odontogenic tumors, like an odontogenic fibroma, which you can see here. So immediately you can see that the epithelium looks quite different. So these epithelial islands actually uh, show this peripheral palisading, um, slight clearing as well which is quite different to what you saw earlier. And the stroma also looks quite different. This looks more cellular. It's got a more sort of mesenchymal appearance to it. It's not as sclerotic. Also, you will not see any perineural invasion and you don't tend to see the infiltrative appearance or tooth destruction. Calcifying epithelial odontogenic tumor can also uh, show similar sort of appearance at times, but it tends to have these amyloid-like areas in them and they are Congo red positive, so that's quite a helpful feature. And the other useful feature is that you tend to see calcifications within a calcifying epithelial odontogenic tumor or most of these tumors, which is something you don't tend to see in a sclerosing odontogenic carcinoma. So let's move on to a CEOT. So these are benign tumors, but are locally and destructive. Um, age of involvement, the mean age is 40 years. And the majority of these tumors are present in the mandible. When in the mandible, uh, they are very common in this molar region, so more towards the posterior aspect. And half of CSTs actually present um, in association with teeth that are still buried in the jaws. So they're still impacted, they're unerupted teeth. And here's an example. 
you can see uh, there's a tumor there, but within the tumor, you can also see there's a tooth-like structure present. 6% of the cases can also present just in the soft tissue. So there's no bony component and it's just present in the soft tissues of the oral cavity. Uh, and on radiology, you can straight away see that it's not all uh, dark or gray in appearance. There are areas which look a bit more white, uh, which are indicative of the calcifications that are present in the tumor. The histology can be fairly variable. So you get these sort of strands and sheets of these uh, eosinophilic cells. Uh, they are cuboidal in appearance. The nuclei are fairly central. They're quite dark staining and almost give an impression of uh, nuclear pleomorphism. Uh, but you never see any mitosis and the key 67 shows a very low uh, proliferation index. Uh, you can also see some clearing. So there is evidence of cytoplasmic clearing in quite a few of uh, COTs. Uh, but in addition, you also tend to get these calcifications, either dentinoid-like areas or calcifications like that. So here's an example of 46-year-old female uh, who presented with a one centimeter swelling. You can see involves the gums in the canine region. It's an asymptomatic lesion, quite firm. And looking at the radiology, uh, if you uh, look at the 3D construction of the CT scan, you can see between the incisor and the canine, uh, there is a little lesion here which shows some evidence of calcification. And the axial uh, plane also shows you that there is some expansion of the mandible there. And again, that white speck uh, indicates uh, evidence of calcification. So here is the WSI for this. So I'll quickly take you through the uh, screen capture. So you can see the surface epithelium on the top and within the connective tissue, uh, there's a well-defined tumor mass, although it's not encapsulated. You can straight away see that it it's forming a lot of calcifications. Uh, the tumor cells appear to have a slightly uh, dark nuclei with some evidence of uh, what's perceived as pleomorphism, but that's quite common for COTs. Um, and in close association with all these tumor cells are these calcifications, but you can also see areas with clear cell change. Uh, and if you carry on moving around, uh, then you'll find areas which have got an amyloid-like appearance and these will be positive for Congo red. Also in the differential of lesions that look a little bit like this is an odontogenic fibroma. Yeah. So particularly histologically, it can look a little bit similar. So you've got this uh, um, fibrotic stroma, and within that you've got these embedded odontogenic epithelial islands, which look quite inactive. So they are somewhat different in appearance to the sclerosing odontogenic carcinoma we saw earlier. Um, and they don't tend to show as much calcification as a COT. There are two variants of it. There's a central variant, which means that the tumor is actually originating or predominantly present in bone, and a peripheral variant, which means and that is present uh, almost entirely within the soft tissues. When you get a central lesion or an intrabony odontogenic fibroma, uh, within the maxilla, they tend to be anterior to the first molar, so towards the front of the mouth, whereas within the mandible, they tend to be more commonly posterior to the first molar. Whereas the peripheral odontogenic fibromas or those in the soft tissue tend to be more common anteriorly. Almost always, these are asymptomatic. And I'll show you an example of a two-year-old girl who presented with a mass involving the left mandible. Um, you can see here the CT scan shows this unerupted tooth. Surrounding it is this cystic lesion. Um, the outside plate of the mandible is not very clear, suggestive there might be some rupture uh, or some resorption of the bone there, but there's obvious expansion. There's also some uh, damage or movement or displacement of the adjacent teeth. If you have a look at the histology, you can straight away see that there's uh, connective tissue, the fibrous tissue here is very fibrotic. It's not sclerotic as it was in sclerosing odontogenic carcinoma, but also the epithelial islands have got a different appearance. Uh, they've got a more typical odontogenic type appearance, which means uh, that um, they've got a peripheral uh, layer of cells, which shows evidence of palisading, uh, 
and here you can see there's a slight hint of palisaded appearance and you can also see in areas that these are in close association uh, with calcifications which is something you will not see in a sclerosing odontogenic carcinoma here is an example of the peripheral variant so you can see the surface epithelium on the top and within the connective tissue is this unencapsulated lesion uh, which has got a similar appearance to the last case um, sort of a mixoid uh, background spindle cells fibroblasts which are bland uh, fusiform and embedded within those are these odontogenic epithelial islands uh, which show evidence of uh, peripheral palisading um, and quite a typical odontogenic appearance inactive looking odontogenic epithelial islands they don't have an infiltrative appearance and there is no bony component so for anytime we see something like that we'd like to see the radiograph and confirm that there is no bony component to the lesion Um, clear cell odontogenic carcinoma is an entity that was described a few years ago and now over 100 cases have been reported. Uh, it affects uh, patients between 40 to 70 years of age and is three times more common in the mandible. You tend to see it more posteriorly in the mandible, so either the body or the ramus towards this side. And this is the typical appearance. It's a poorly defined lesion which has got... Um, um, a jagged outline you can see the main bulk of the lesion is here but there's also a shadow extending posteriorly there between the teeth as well and it's almost always a slow growing lesion but with time it will cause pain it can cause ulceration also loosening of the teeth and damage and resorption of the adjacent structures on histology, you tend to see these uh, uh, either strands or trabeculae or sheets of uh, predominantly clear cells. The nuclei are fairly central. Um, and in the areas where the tumor cells are not clear, they might be slightly eosinophilic in appearance. Another key and useful feature is that the stroma, which intervenes between these tumor islands, uh, is quite prominently fibrotic and hyalinized. And this historically was called a hyalinizing they were called hyalinizing uh, clear cell carcinomas, but now the terminology has changed. You can get formation of dentinoid or inductive change. Um, cytokeratins and P63 is diffusely positive. The useful feature is that uh, uh, over 80% of clear cell odontogenic carcinomas show an EWSR rearrangement. And in uh, the majority of the cases, the partner of EWSR is ATF1, similar to Ewing sarcoma. But in some cases, it's been shown that they can also partner with CREP1. So that's quite a useful diagnostic test if you're seeing an odontogenic lesion, which has got clear cells. But the one thing to remember is that it doesn't always uh, have all the cells as clear. So you may have a variety of appearances. So here is an example. So again, you can see the surface epithelium there. So it's a tumor that's uh, burst out of bone into the soft tissue. Uh, and as you zoom in, you can see these islands of tightly packed or nests of these tumors, cells showing quite prominent clearing. Uh, nuclei are somewhat hyperchromatic, uh, but also within these tumor islands, you can see this a very dense stroma. Other useful features that can help you differentiate it from the lesions we discussed previously. Uh, it doesn't show any calcifications. Look at the radiology, of course, uh, to see if there's any damage to the adjacent structures and the fish testing that I've mentioned earlier. But one thing that makes it slightly different to sclerosing odontogenic carcinoma is that this tumor does have metastatic and recurrence potential, so it's slightly more high grade. And also some uh, case reports of high-grade transformation within these tumors have also been described, which can be very mitotically active and show quite brisk key 67 uh, positivity as well. The tumor can only be focally clear. So here you can see towards the lower aspect, these cells are uh, have a clear cytoplasm, whereas if you move higher up, uh, you start to lose that and the tumor cells appear to have a more eosinophilic appearance. And the differential diagnosis of these lesions, always be mindful of lesions that can show clear cells. So sclerosing odontogenic carcinoma we discussed already. Uh, 
but that will um, um, have a slightly different uh, appearance. You've got the fibro uh, sclerotic stroma. Okay. Uh, think about a metastasis from a different side. So renal cell carcinoma can very frequently metastasize to the jaws. And here is an example uh, of uh, an RCC met within the maxilla. It tends to have this packeted appearance. It lacks the really fibrous stroma. And the RCC also has this really vascular background to it as well. Of course, it will be positive for RCC antigen and CD10, which can help you differentiate. But also things like uh, mucoepidermoid carcinoma, particularly a central variant, can show a quite prominent clear cell change. Uh, but that will be positive for CK7 and also has its own translocation, which is the MAML2 rearrangement, which can help you differentiate. <clears throat> now I'll just go through a number of other lesions which can so amyloblastoma you may have heard of um, it's a benign but locally aggressive lesion uh, involves patients between 30 to 50 years of age and 80 percent of these present in the mandible the most common site is the angle of the mandible uh, but these have a tendency to recur and if untreated or in the recurrent forms you can get extensive growth and a small percentage of these have also been shown or reported to become malignant. And here's a nice uh, example of a specimen of an amyloblastoma, and this is the mandible uh, section through. You can see the teeth, and you can see this predominantly cystic tumor uh, involving the mandible. And logically, it uh, can show a variety of appearances, but the main appearance that you see is this radiolucent lesion. So largely darker looking grayish blackish appearance mostly well defined okay it can be in association with the tooth that has not erupted it causes bony expansion particularly in cases that have been there for a long time uh, it can be unilocular we discussed earlier what uh, unilocular is sort of almost just like a single locule you're not seeing any fibrous septi within this tumor or it can be multilocular almost like a soap bubble type appearance, which you can see here. It is also quite common for amyloblastomas to show this uh, damage to the teeth, so resorption of the teeth and adjacent structures. You can see the teeth have also been pushed out of place a little bit. Here is another example showing something similar. So this is the typical appearance of an amyloblastoma. You get these uh, peripheral cells, which are amyloblasts, and they show that um, uh, peripheral palisading that we saw earlier, which is uh, a typical of odontogenic epithelium, um, nuclei shifting away from the basin membrane, and the central areas, which are a bit more loose uh, and stellate reticulum like. So here is an example of an amyloblastoma involving the maxilla. So, towards the left side is the surface epithelium, and towards the right side, you can see the maxillary bone. And just adjacent to the bone uh, is an amyloblastoma. This is a recurrent amyloblastoma. As you can see, it's out of the bone into the soft tissues. But you can also see that there's an obvious cystic component to it. We've got the typical amyloblastoma-like areas uh, with the peripheral palisading, reversal polarity, and the central stellate reticulum-like areas. The stroma is variably dense. Uh, there is no obvious evidence of atypia or mitosis, but also there's some areas which show evidence of squamous change or what we call acanthomatous change. So amyloblastomas can uh, show a variety of appearances. Uh, so one I've described already is this prominent keratinization or acanthomatous appearance. You can get a unicystic variant, uh, which means that the lesion is almost like a cyst and the lining is actually amyloblastoma, and all the tumor is actually proliferating either within the lumen or just within the wall and not beyond it. Or you can get a peripheral variant, which means that there is no tumor present within the bone, it's just present within the soft tissues of the mouth. And this tends to be quite common in the gums, particularly in the mandible right at the back uh, behind your molar teeth. These lesions tend to be fairly asymptomatic, so just a removal, simple removal is usually enough. Unicystic amyloblastomas have been shown to have quite a good prognosis, so you can just enucleate them like a cyst, and they shouldn't recur. 
whereas a conventional ameloblastoma requires a resection with a healthy bone margin to prevent recurrence. So there's a malignant variant of it, which is an ameloblastic carcinoma, and it's usually in patients who are um, old age. Mandible is the most common site, uh, and uh, on radiology, you see really aggressive growth. So here's the mandible. You can see the superficial cortex of the mandible, the inferior border of the mandible, and on this side. But in the middle, you've got a lesion or a shadow, and you can't follow these lines across. And this lesion has actually destroyed the mandible. Uh, it's caused extensive bone resorption, and it's burst out of the mandible. On histology, you see quite obvious pleomorphism, uh, as is evident on this picture. So there's obvious hyperchromatism, there's increased cellularity, mitotic figures. You can also see lymphovascular and perineural invasion. And if you are worried uh, between a conventional myeloblastoma and uh, an ameloblastic carcinoma, key 67 can be helpful, but look for mitotic figures and also look at radiology. Also quite important to rule out a primary interosseous carcinoma or a metastasis. Now I'll quickly cover odontogenic keratosis. So the only thing that has changed about this uh, in the recent classification is we've gone back to the old name. So if you remember the previous classification uh, changed the name to keratocystic odontogenic tumor and implied that these were actually neoplastic, but now it, the original terminology has been referred and they are uh, thought of as cysts again and not as tumors. So majority of these cysts involve the mandible and half of them actually involve the angle of the mandible. If these are not removed completely, then they have a tendency to recur. And there is also an association with goal in goal syndrome. On histology, the typical appearance you see is that uh, a cyst lumen, which would be here, is lined by this epithelial lining which shows this quite prominent corrugated surface. So this pink layer of parakeratin, which has got an irregular surface. The lining is usually five to eight cells thick. And you also get this quite striking basal cell palisading or reversal of polarity, which is quite a useful feature. In some odontogenic keratosis, you get daughter cysts or satellite cysts within the wall. And there's some papers that have suggested that that might be related to um, higher risk of recurrence. They can present as a unilocular radiolucency or a multilocular radiolucency. So you can see there is two obvious locules here, uh, which is somewhat different to this lesion. If you see more than one keratosis in the patient, uh, they're almost always related to golden gold syndrome, which is also called the basal cell nevus syndrome. So here on the left side of the mandible, you can see this tooth and in association with that is this quite well-defined cystic lesion. Uh, but also on the other side, you see somewhat larger lesion, which is multilocular. So multiple keratosis are one of the features of golden gold syndrome. One lesion that is somewhat related to this and similar is orthokeratinized odontogenic cyst. So in the previous classification, they were thought of as a variant of um, an odontogenic keratosis, but now it's recognized that this is a separate entity. And why is that? Uh, it's still more common in the mandible, uh, but it shows orthokeratin instead of parakeratin. Um, you don't tend to see that basal cell palisading uh, that is quite striking. Um, and an obvious feature of uh, an odontogenic keratosis. So here you can see uh, quite prominent orthokeratosis and the basal cells of these, uh, this epithelial lining uh, is cuboidal and not columnar and doesn't show palisading. They also rarely recur. One lesion which can radiologically look somewhat similar to an ameloblastoma or a keratosis is a myxoma. It is a benign neoplasm is locally aggressive, predominantly involves the mandible and shows this typical so bubble type appearance. Smaller lesions are asymptomatic, but the larger it gets, the more problems it can cause. Um, but the problem with treating these lesions is that it's got a permeative margin. Um, so it may clinically extend beyond what you think. Um, and it extends through the marrow spaces 
uh, and uh, usually you need to do a resection uh, to actually get a healthy margin just like an amyloblastoma histologically you get this main prominent feature which is the myxoid areas intermixed with some of these uh, fibrous areas um, the amount of these uh, tissue types or areas can be variable you can have a lot of myxoid areas and in the myxoid um, areas you get this sort of ground substance like material uh, these sort of fusiform stellate uh, fibroblasts which are scattered uh, within that fibrous uh, and myxoid tissue and you also see fragments of bone like this uh, which match the multi locular appearance you're seeing on the radiology so these multiple locules of the bony septi you're seeing on radiology you can almost always see them histologically as well particularly in the resection specimens so i just thought here i'll add an interesting case um, a 44 year old male patient uh, presented with a painless cyst in the lower right mandible so here's the last standing molar another two there and then there is a shadow or, or a lesion there so at first glance you might think this is just a cystic lesion but when you have a closer look you can see that the roots of the teeth seem to have disappeared and damaged so they are resorbed which just indicates that it's probably something a bit more aggressive than originally thought and you look at the histology there's multiple tissue specimens here okay and so it looks like there's a cystic lesion and the cystic lesion is being lined by this epithelial lining with a fibrous wall towards the other side this epithelial lining is actually showing evidence of full thickness dysplasia so you've got quite prominent hyperchromatism uh, disorder stratification here you see the abnormal reti pegs and as you move along the dysplasia gets more and more prominent and you almost end up with undifferentiated and poorly differentiated squamous cells which are invading the wall of the um, presumed cyst towards the periphery so this is a primary intraosseous carcinoma and uh, PIOC is the jaw carcinoma which cannot be categorized as any other type of carcinoma it is believed to arise from odontogenic epithelium particularly in long-standing odontogenic cysts and dentigerous cysts have been quoted as one of the main sources of its origin very common in the posterior part of the mandible like most odontogenic tumors and what we need to do for this diagnosis is actually you need to exclude any other diagnosis or cause so first of all we need to rule out that there is no evidence of an oral cancer or squamous cell carcinoma within the oral cavity invading into bone no evidence of metastatic carcinoma from elsewhere in cases of maxillary tumors you need to rule out whether there's an antral primary which might be pushing into the maxilla so despite them being around for a while only 116 cases have been reported today so still quite rare and because they rise in the bone and they are squamous um, or primary bone cancers uh, comprising squamous cells right now they do not comply with any of the TNM staging systems now let's look at squamous odontogenic tumor uh, it's very rare it usually involves the anterior mandible or posterior maxilla and radiologically you get this unilocular radiolucency so quite a well-defined shadow type appearance almost always present between the roots of the teeth and quite commonly it is triangular in appearance between the roots of the teeth in some cases the radiology can look almost similar to sclerosing odontogenic carcinoma that i showed you earlier but you don't tend to see that tissue destruction because this is a benign tumor and on histology, uh, you just see these islands of very bland squamous epithelium within um, fibrous tissue with no evidence of keratinization. And here's an example of a case. So you can see this fibrous tissue. Uh, there's focal evidence of cystic degeneration, but no keratinization. These squamous islands are very bland, and there's no evidence of atypia or mitosis and uh, that's a very typical appearance for a squamous odontogenic tumor amyloplastic fibromas are another benign tumor usually quite small uh, but 
can grow larger if not treated and they usually involve younger patients uh, so age up to 20 uh, and a slow growing and usually asymptomatic um, a conservative removal is usually sufficient so you don't need to do extensive surgery and mandible is the most common site uh, and this is the typical appearance you get usually they are much smaller in size and you get this quite well defined uh, radial lucent lesion so it doesn't have any sort of white areas or calcification in it and when you look at the histology of it it's somewhat similar to an odontogenic fibroma but the stroma or the connective tissue is very mesenchymal in appearance so the ectomesenchyme from which the tooth develops is very similar to this as is the follicle of the tooth from which the tooth develops and embedded within uh, this uh, fibrous tissue are these islands of uh, odontogenic epithelium and they show the same appearance uh, as we saw previously that peripheral palisading um, and also in areas you've got quite prominently mixoid appearance uh, which is something again that you see in a dental follicle or a developing tooth Now, adenomatide odontogenic tumor can present very similar to a dental follicle or to a dentigerous cyst. They are benign tumors, uh, but they usually do not recur if removed completely. And the patients uh, that are usually affected are 10 to 20 years of age with a slightly higher incidence in females. They tend to be more common in maxilla. And what you usually see is a cystic radiolucent lesion involving a tooth which is not erupted. So here's an example you can see, so that's the mandible, that's fairly normal. If you look at the maxilla there, you can't see the uh, posterior wall of the sinus and the zygomatic buttress there. There's a tooth here that's impacted or still buried within the maxilla and surrounding it is this cystic lesion, uh, which is quite large and actually pushing some of these teeth downwards as well. Here's another example. This is a canine which has not erupted yet. And you can see the surrounding it is this quite well defined. This is much smaller and you could uh, easily uh, think that this was a dentigerous cyst. But the histology is uh, quite characteristic. So you see this variety of appearances. It looks quite basaloid and bluish in appearance of first class. And you get these nodules of epithelium which show quite prominent whirling architecture. So these swirling um, islands of epithelium. There is no evidence of atypia, um, and you also uh, see some evidence of duct-like structures like here. Um, you see evidence of calcification, um, which is like here, so dentinoid or um, almost amyloid-like areas as well, which would be positive uh, for Congo red. Now let's quickly look at lesion with ghost cells. So calcifying odontogenic cyst. Um, uh, is a lesion, uh, the name of which has been recently changed. So we used to also have a lesion called calcified cystic odontogenic tumor. That's now been removed. Um, so any simple cyst or a uni sort of cystic lesion is now called a calcifying odontogenic cyst. It's the most common of the ghost cell lesions. It's benign, involves patient 10 to 30 years of age. More commonly involves the maxilla, but can involve the mandible and uh, can be in association with an odontome and i'll cover odontomes in a little bit and here is an example uh, of a calcifying odontogenic cyst uh, here's a case of a 60 year old male a recurrent swelling involving the right mandible in the premolar region uh, the dentist extracted the tooth thinking the cyst was related to that but the swelling is not improved and the ct scan actually shows you uh, a fairly large lesion which actually seems to have perforated and as almost uh, sort of uh, burst through the mandible in that area. And when you look at the histology, you see this unicystic lesion with the central lumen that's lined by this quite dark uh, basaloid looking epithelium and has a fibrous tissue wall towards the periphery. When you have a closer look at the epithelium, it's got an appearance very similar to an amyloblastoma. You've got that peripheral palisading there and slightly more loose cells resembling slate reticulum um, in close association with that. But of course, the key and striking feature is presence of these calcifications uh, of ghost cells. Uh, 
Now, the other lesion with ghost cell you need to be mindful of is the antigenic ghost cell tumor. Uh, this is less common. Uh, it's not unicystic. It tends to be a bit more solid um, and uh, involves quite a wide age range, so not uh, patients aren't as young, so 10 to 75 years. Mandible is more common, whereas maxilla was more common for uh, the calcifying odontogenic cyst. And you tend to get a well-defined radiolucent lesion. But as you can see here, there's some white specks within that, which indicate there's some calcification. And that's the typical appearance that you get. You get this sort of dentinoid-like area, so this hard tissue formation in close association with these odontogenic epithelial islands. And there's extension into the surrounding tissue. Some of the epithelial islands or epithelium can look very much like an amyloblastoma or a calcifying odontogenic cyst. It will have uh, these um, uh, ghost cells, uh, so evidence of keratinization uh, and uh, calcifications, but it's just going to be a bit more extensive uh, than a calcifying odontogenic cyst. And here's an example showing a lesion which has actually perforated through the jaw into the soft tissues of the oral cavity. Um, you can see it looks fairly eosinophilic, which indicates the calcifications uh, and the keratinization within it. There is a giant cell response to it in places. Um, and also towards the left side of the lesion, uh, you can see that there is uh, an epithelial lining, uh, which looks a little bit like uh, an amyloblastoma, whereas on the right side, you've got these ghost cells and quite a few giant cells. Now, odontomes or odontomas are described as the most common odontogenic tumor in the WHO book, but they are actually uh, a hematoma, so they're benign malformations of dental heart tissues. They usually involve young patients up to uh, 20 years of age, can present in both mandible and maxilla. And on radiology, you tend to see this sort of appearance. Uh, you get uh, uh, something usually in close association with the tooth, so these little sort of um, tooth-like uh, fragments which are radio opaque so they're white in appearance um, they can be more well defined and actually look like a tooth and in that case they are called compound odontomes like here or they can be a more haphazard mass of dental heart tissue in which case they're called complex odontomes and here's an example of a complex odontome um, so this is a decalcified tissue section um, the dark pink areas there. So these are amyloblasts, which actually secrete the enamel. This fish scale-like material is actually uh, sorry, uncalcified enamel matrix. So this is immature enamel matrix, which has got a prismatic architecture. Um, and as you move around, you'll see uh, that there are other types of dental heart tissue present as well. Uh, so there are some uh, sort of bluish fragments, which are rem reminiscent of uh, cementum. And this area actually is dentine. So you can see these white lines running through this tissue, and that's actually dentinal tibules. So all of the dental heart tissues are present, but in a really haphazard manner. So we'll quickly cover developing odontome, which is a slightly earlier version of an odontome. And the WHO has got rid of the terminology amyloblastic fiber odontome, and this is somewhat con con uh, controversial. Uh, because some people think that uh, amyloblastic fibrodontum is a bit more aggressive and should be a separate entity. So here's an example of a nine-year-old boy with a well-circumscribed lesion. Here you can see this is a shadow of a lesion. It's got a white border around it. And this is actually stopping this permanent tooth uh, from erupting. And when you look at the histology, it's got the similar sort of dental follicle or ectomesian kind of appearance. It's got a slightly mixed white appearance, a bluish appearance. Uh, within that, you've got these scattered uh, fibroblasts. Um, and then in the other fragments, if you move around, you see a lot of odontogenic epithelial islands showing a similar type of appearance with the peripheral palisading. But focally, you see this dark pink hyalinized material in close association with the odontogenic epithelium. And this is inductive change or dentinoid-like material. Whereas amyloblastic fibrodontomes can grow quite large or can be quite large, cause significant amount of resorption and damage to the uh, adjacent structure. Here you can see the mandible has been resolved, the teeth have been moved. There's evidence of calcification in there as well. Uh, 
And histologically, they are somewhat similar to the developing odontome, but just uh, more prominent features. So you've got the odontogenic epithelial islands, which are embedded within this really hyalinized material, which is dentinoid or uh, newly formed dental heart tissue. And surrounding it is this mesenchymal um, tissue. So I'll quickly cover fibroosseous lesions, so they can be quite challenging. So one thing that has changed is the word cemento has been added to cemento osseous dysplasias and cemento ossifying fibromas, um, just to indicate uh, their odontogenic origin. Uh, I'll cover those two and also a little bit of fibrous dysplasia. So the ossifying fibromas of the head and neck can largely be divided into three. So cemento ossifying fibromas, uh, which affect um, young adults, the mean age of 35, and are in the tooth-bearing areas of the jaws. And most of them are in the mandible. There's a juvenile trabecular ossifying fibroma that's in much younger patients than children. 10 years of age is the mean. It can involve maxilla or the mandible. And there's a juvenile somomatoid variant of an ossifying fibroma, which tends to involve the craniofacial bones or any craniofacial bone. And this tends to usually involve patients approximately 20 years of age. So cemento ossifying fibroma is the most common type, 70% those and usually presents uh, this really sort of well-defined corticated lesion. It's got a nice white border to it. And most of it is sort of dark in appearance with some areas that look slightly white. It's, uh, it's got slow growth uh, and um, it originates or thought to be originating in the periodontal ligament. The lesion has a well-defined margin usually um, and is separated from the cortical bone. So if you have a look uh, at this slide, the periphery is more like normal bone or the cortex of the lesion. And towards the lower aspect, is the actual lesional tissue. So you've got these haphazard, irregular bony fragments almost look like woven bone uh, with very dense, very big cellular fibrous tissue, which is replacing this bone. Now the amount or pattern of the bone and soft tissue can be quite variable. So you can have lesions which are predominantly uh, bone containing with some fibrous tissue or they can be predominantly fibrous uh, with occasional fragments of bone. And here's an example of a juvenile somomatoid ossifying fibroma, 24-year-old female. Uh, you can see this quite extensive lesion, which is perforated and extended through the maxilla there. And uh, on histology, uh, you can see there's only little specks of calcifications uh, within this lesion. And most of it is very bicellular uh, fibrous tissue, which has almost got a a uh, fascicle-like pattern, and then these uh, somomatoid-type calcifications scattered throughout. Fibrous dysplasia can histologically look identical to an ossifying fibroma, but it is not a tumor, it's a developmental or reactive lesion. It can affect the head and neck, and it's uh, fairly equal in males and females. Maxilla tends to be the more common site, and the key feature that we look for is uh, in on radiology. So if you remember ossifying fibroma, it had a nice border to it and you can uh, you could differentiate it from the surrounding uh, um, structures. And here you can see this ground glass type appearance, uh, this uh, quite dense bone, which just seems to blend in and merge with the surrounding bone. It doesn't seem to have an obvious border to it. It's quite typical of fibrous dysplasia. You can get a monostotic form, which just involves a single bone, polystotic, which involves multiple bone, or in association with McCune, Albright syndrome, and 70 to 80 percent of fibrous dysplasia harbor the GNAS mutation. So, if you got the fish testing available, that can be quite useful uh, and help you differentiate. Looking at them side by side, fibrous dysplasia, uh, more poorly defined lesions, uh, they lack the clear margin as opposed to ossifying fibroma. Ossifying fibromas are more common in females, uh, and also ossifying fibroma more common in mandible, as fibrous dysplasia is more common in maxilla. Um, I'll quickly cover cementoosseous dysplasia because, again, histology can look very similar. It's a clinical pathological spectrum of reactive lesions. Um, and you tend to get these multiple radio opacities, so these really dense sort of irregular uh, white fragments that you're seeing next to the roots of these teeth um, is a sort of typical appearance that you see in the florid form of cementoosseous dysplasia. It affects females more uh, within an age group of 30 to 50 years of age. 
uh, and you've got a focal type, uh, periapical type, and florid type. So if you look at them side by side, the focal type is only got one lesion, okay? Age group of 30 to 50 years, a small localized lesion, and you've got the irregular trabecular woven bone and cementum. The periapical version is called so because it is present at the apex of the tooth or the root of the tooth, uh, and it can be just in one region or it can be multiple regions, okay? Whereas the florid variant actually uh, can involve multiple quadrants of the jaws. Uh, so 40 to 60 years of age, uh, it often involves a mandible, can be bilateral, uh, more common in females, more common in uh, females with uh, an Afro-Caribbean origin. And on histology, you tend to see these masses of uh, fused bone and cementum like heart tissue. So it's, it's a lot more sort of basophilic with these reversal lines. And similar to that is a, a benign tumor called cementoblastoma. So histologically, you can see it's got a similar sort of appearance. You've got the fibrous tissue, you've got the sort of basophilic uh, bone. Uh, but radiologically, this is a well-defined tumor which is actually attached to the root of the tooth. So on radiology, you can see that it's got mixed appearance of white areas, predominantly radiopaque. Macroscopically, you can see it's attached to the roots of the tooth. And histologically as well, you can see there's a lesion which is actually originating from the root of the tooth. Almost always it affects the permanent teeth, so the baby teeth or the deciduous teeth are not affected. And the differential diagnosis of this includes things like an osteoblastoma, which has got exactly the same appearance but is not attached to the tooth, or an osteoma, uh, which is uh, usually involves the ramus region of the mandible. It's smaller than two centimeters with a central nidus. But the cementoblast in the cementoblastoma can look really plump uh, and almost abnormal. And uh, you might mistake them uh, for um, an osteosarcoma if you're not used to looking at them. So here's an example of a 17-year-old male with a well-defined lesion. Um, you can see it there in association with the roots of the tooth. Uh, and on histology as well, you can see uh, that this lesion is actually starting off uh, from one of the roots. Uh, of the tooth here. So quite uh, sort of basophilic appearance with prominent reversal lines, uh, but elsewhere uh, you've got almost uh, similar appearance to fibrous dysplasia or an ossifying fibroma. So histologically can be very difficult to differentiate with. And again, radiolo radiological analysis becomes very important. So to sum it up, there's quite a large number of odontogenic tumors, and although some of them show some specific features, there's quite a range of appearances uh, and quite a lot of overlapping features. You don't always tend to see the overt atypia or dysplasia, uh, which is associated with malignant tumors elsewhere in the body. So you need to be very meticulous and careful in your uh, examination. There are some useful adjuncts, uh, such as Congored, uh, you can do fish testing or molecular testing for things like fibrous dysplasia or clay cell odontogenic carcinoma, etc. Things like E67 or MIB1 immunohistochemistry can also be useful. But the most important thing is the radiological and clinical correlation. And I would say it's absolutely essential, actually. And thank you very much for listening. I hope that was helpful. Uh, and apologize, there was a lot of slides, but I tried to just cover everything uh, or most of the relevant and common things and give you a nice idea with some example cases. Thanks a lot for listening. Thank you, Dr. Kuram, for this excellent and very informative talk. I have a few questions that I see online, so I will read them to you. Just the one uh, very relevant to your most recent discussion. So the question is, which odontogenic tumors require aggressive surgery and which require more conservative surgery? So when I'm guessing when you're saying odontogenic tumor, you're just talking about benign odontogenic tumors. So when we think about benign odontogenic tumors, I would say amyloblastoma and odontogenic myxoma would probably require more aggressive treatment. Um, in terms of malignant ones, it really depends the stage of the tumor. So things like a clear cell odontogenic carcinoma, obviously are more aggressive than a sclerosing odontogenic carcinoma. But most of the cases, local uh, sort of excision with a margin is sufficient. Uh, and things like an amyloblastic carcinoma, which is quite extensive, you may have to consider to think about uh, neck dissection or at least monitor for future recurrence and metastatic spread.
right so there is a, another question that i can see uh tim wants to know what's the difference between tear cell odontogenic carcinoma uh and hyalinizing tear cell carcinoma of salivary gland origin like how do you histologically differentiate that's what i think the question it's a very good question and in some ways, it's probably on H and E. It can be quite challenging uh, unless you can see the origin from the salivary tissue itself. Uh, the one main difference is that in the hyalinizing clear cell carcinoma, well, it's just called clear cell carcinoma now, the salivary gland. The hyalinization is much more striking. Um, if you do uh, staining for periodic acid shift or periodic acid shift with diastase digestion, uh, the sort of uh, Hyalinized material around the tumor islands hi is highlighted really nicely in the salivary uh, version. And you may also see some mucin droplets within the tumor. Of course, immunohistochemistry can help you. So CK7 will be positive in the salivary uh, version uh, of the tumor, whereas it will be negative in the odontogenic tumor. Right. So another question that I can see is, uh, is odontogenic fibroma and ameloblastic fibroma are the same entities? Um, they're not the same entities uh, because histologically there's slight differences. So odontogenic fibroma has got a sort of slightly more uh, uh, dense and fibrous uh, stroma or connective tissue to it. Ameloblastic fibroma has got uh, the epithelial islands in it have got a more ameloblastoma-like appearance and the surrounding uh, tissue or the connective tissue or the stroma uh, has got a more mesenchymal or dental follicle-like appearance. So it seems to almost arise in dental follicle. Of course, with ontogenic fibroma, you've got the central and the peripheral variants as well. They can also show calcifications. Ameloblastic fibroma don't always show calcifications. But there's some people who also think that ameloblastic fibroma is actually part of the developing odontome spectrum. Uh, but right now, they are separate entities. Who knows, in the next 10, 20 years, maybe they'll, that will change. Right. And another question is, any reported malignant transformation in SOT? Uh, good question. I think I've, uh, I was uh, looking at it this morning, and I think there's only one or two cases of reported malignant transformation. Um, but because they're just case reports, it's very difficult to sort of um, um, rely on them too much because, of course, you, if there is a primary oral carcinoma which extends into the bone, you have to exclude that as your differential. So to establish that there was um, actually an origin within the squamous odontogenic tumor, uh, I'm guessing would be very challenging. But uh, from the literature search I did, I can find one or two case reports which have reported that, although I've never seen it myself. All right. There is another question which uh, uh, someone is saying that why not call it P-I-O-S-C-C -C instead of just P-I-O-C, as if it may have other forms than being squamous in nature. There is a P-I-O-S-C-C -C as well as a P-I-O-C, but they sort of use interchangeably. Um, I think uh, it doesn't always look typically squamous as the case I showed you. Uh, although it will be positive for squamous markers, you don't always see the typical squamous appearance. It can look very sort of uh, undifferentiated or poorly differentiated. But P-I-O-C and P-I-O-S-C-C are sort of fairly interchangeable and mean the same sort of thing. Right. So one question is, how do we differentiate between a peripheral ameloblastoma and a basal cell carcinoma? Very good question. So a basal cell carcinoma, as you know, is an appendageal tumor, so you shouldn't really get it intraorally. Um, so something that is actually originating from the oral mucosa, unless you can prove that it's arising from that um, oral epithelium, is not really a typical site for it. Um, there's some... Um, groups that have actually tried to do stains like bury before etc but they can be sort of fairly variable across odontogenic tumors um, when i was a trainee i also used to think and uh, believe that perhaps these were intraoral basal cell carcinomas uh, but right now the evidence isn't strong enough and so yeah you exclude or look at the possibility there might be a bcc on the skin uh, and it might be pushing through and presenting as this but primary intraoral basal cell carcinoma, it would be a very difficult cell um, because it just doesn't arise from the oral epithelium. Right. Uh, 
So uh, there's another question that I see on YouTube that uh, with so many confusing entities, uh, do you have any critical points and some parts that we should always remember and do not miss them? Yeah, I think the important thing to remember is the management. So don't get too bogged down by the terminology. So remember, important things are like, is it a cyst? Is it a benign tumor? Is it a malignant tumor? If it's a malignant tumor, is it a low grade or a high grade malignant tumor? And those are the important things. Getting the subtype right, although academically is relevant, perhaps diagnostically and patient treatment wise is not that relevant. So don't get too bogged down by that. So just focus on the basics. Um, look at the radiology and if you're not sure, and there's lots of really good videos on YouTube which can take you to uh, features of radiology and what to look for. But you're also more than welcome to share images uh, online, either on Twitter or feel free to email uh, them to me. But you're absolutely right. It is confusing. Uh, but try and take a simple approach step by step. Stick to the basics first um, and think about patient management and how um, that is more important than your specific subtype of diagnosis. Because if it's a low-grade tumor and doing three different uh, fish analysis gets you the final diagnosis and the treatment is the same, and you probably haven't achieved this a lot so you just have to take everything with a pinch of salt and also depends on what's available at your center as well so any role of fnac uh, in giving a provisional diagnosis in unilocular lesions before surgery for example for differentiating unicystic ameloblastoma and okc uh, i would say no <laughs> because uh, historically people used to do fna for keratocysts, but as you've seen that this keratin-like material or ghost cells can be present in other lesions as well. Um, so I would say never do FNAs for intraoral lesions, whether they're bony or otherwise. Uh, best option to do is an open biopsy and get enough representative tissue. So even if you want to do further tests, you can do that. Right. So there is a, one last question I would add from Dr. Iman in Egypt who wants to know, are there any helpful features to diagnose inflamed odontogenic keratocysts from other such as residual cysts? And are differentiation will affect the surgical intervention dramatically or just for follow-up? Uh, very good question and very relevant question. So yeah, when you get extensive inflammation with odontogenic keratocysts, you tend to lose that keratinization are the typical features. So the important thing, what I do is basically just make sure you look at every bit of the lining. And if you want to call or you're thinking about a keratosis, you definitely need to find at least one or two areas where there are typically keratosis-like features. Uh, look at the radiology, like I said, if it's quite large lesion, it's multilocular, then it's not a dentigerous cyst or a residual cyst. It's more likely to be a odontogenic keratosis. Um, so look at those things and then sort of uh, try to come to a final diagnosis. And in terms of treatment, right now odontogenic keratosis are still just enucleated, just like a residual or a dentigerous cyst. But because there's a slightly higher risk of recurrence, uh, there is an option to actually use a fixative like carnoid solution. So a bony cavity is opened and then a fixative is poured in to make sure that the lining is fixed before you remove it to reduce the risk of recurrence. And also some people have shown or indicated that maybe marsupialization, which is opening the cyst and stitching it to the inside of the mouth and letting it shrink over a period of time and then removing it might be a strategy. Uh, but at the minute, the removal is fairly similar. So perhaps it doesn't change um, the treatment a lot. If you just got a small fragment of a biopsy and you can't be sure, that's what you say. So as a pathologist, you can only say what you see. Look at the radiology look at the biopsy, report what you see, and you just say that I cannot rule out uh, the fact that it is a keratosis, but once you remove it, I'll have more tissue to look at it and perhaps I can uh, be a bit more helpful. Thank you again, Dr. Kuram. And actually there are a lot more questions. Maybe you would be able to visit them online and answer individually if you have time. Sure. And uh, I would like to uh, extend all my thanks to all the viewers and in fact everybody is uh, uh, extending a lot of thanks for your excellent presentation and they all found it very informative and in fact you'd be so happy to hear that uh, we had uh, live viewers from like over 33 countries and they oh, were wow. in thousands so that is really good and thank you all of our viewers and if you like the lectures please
uh, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel that is Patcast and follow our Facebook page that is also Patcast. And thank you again, Dr. Kuram. Thanks no so problem. much. Thanks a lot for asking me to speak and thank you to all of you for listening. And if you've got any questions that I haven't answered, please feel free to email me and get in touch and I'll be happy to reply and help. Uh, yeah, and take and care all, of yourself and stay safe. Yes, you do. And all viewers, please stay tuned. We have a lecture on 17th of April. So that would be uh, on the experience of how COVID-19 is being handled in Taiwan, a laboratory perspective. And please stay tuned. Thank you so much.